Before we get started with today's show, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the thrill of the case, case studies, drug interactions, and clinical pearls in medication management. When I talked to Eric Christensen, who is of MedEd 101, but also has great resources for BCPS and, and those things and is board certified, uh, he made pharmacotherapy, which was the book you heard in the last episode or the episode before last, about improving medical case education through clinical pharmacy pearls, case studies, and common sense. And what people wanted was just more cases. And the thrill of the case is that, that people were just thrilled that they really enjoyed pharmacotherapy and they wanted to, you know, just get more. Uh, and uh, again, you know, these are both audio, audible audiobooks. So if you've never had one before, uh, you can try it out, get it for free. Uh, and it allows you to kind of listen to these on the way to and from residency, on the way to and from your appies, and really get an understanding of what it is uh, to tackle a case. So I'm going to give you the five minute uh, preview uh, from uh, Audible. And again, I'll have the uh, links in the show notes. Uh, and then we'll follow that up with our last episode with. Maya Thompson of the University of Iowa, uh, who's going to go over her four kind of tactics uh, to uh, crack a clinical case. And again, she has a lot of experience in the hospital uh, as an employee, uh, actually, and uh, has some great tips on making sure that, you know, you're impressing your preceptors and uh, doing the right things for your patients. So here we go. This is the thrill of the case, case studies, drug interaction, and clinical pearls in medication management by Eric Christensen, narrated by Michael Lenz, and produced by me. Start solving clinical cases today. For many students and residents, a case-based approach works better, helping them understand the process of becoming a clinician. Unfortunately, the decision to become a clinician may come at a time when classes, rotations, or experiences don't match up with your desire to start solving cases right now. In this book, you'll follow a clinical practitioner who clearly articulates his thought process in providing the best patient care. The book organizes up-to-date management and treatment options by pathophysiologic group, so you can work alongside your class or rotation. You might see the same case day after day, but by hearing what a clinician with 10 years of experience does with complex cases, you can start to develop the advanced skills for better patient care. Each case has review questions to reinforce important, highly tested topics. Instead of hearing dry facts, each case is a story. You can hear how classroom concepts become clinical pearls and reinforce the clinical significance of often difficult to understand concepts. Whether you're trying to study for a board exam, develop additional clinical competence on your commute or between work and classes, or just are curious about what a clinical health practitioner does, this book will not disappoint. I hope you enjoy the journey through these clinical cases and find you can very much make a difference when you have the right tools. Let's explore the thrill of the case. Chapter 1. Case Studies. Gastrointestinal Case Studies. G1. PPIs for NSAID prophylaxis. Case Study. For patients on chronic NSAIDs, using PPIs for GI prophylaxis is a common practice. In the geriatric population especially, there is a significant GI ulcer risk from NSAIDs. The polypharmacy problem is big. Make sure you pay attention to the diagnosis and PPI's intended use. Let's take a look at the case. An 82-year-old female with a past medical history of osteoarthritis, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and coronary artery disease was experiencing intense osteoarthritic pain. Increases in acetaminophen did not adequately relieve her discomfort. Cold weather exacerbated her condition. The provider wanted to start her on 500 milligrams of naproxen twice daily to help manage the pain. With naproxen, the patient would need GI prophylaxis, 20 milligrams of omeprazole daily, to help prevent an NSAID-induced ulcer. The patient started the naproxen with minor relief, and the primary provider started tramadol as needed. At this point, the patient stopped taking naproxen. After that, she was hospitalized for a non-pain-related reason, but was never told to discontinue the proton pump inhibitor, PPI. After her discharge from the hospital, physicians clarified a new diagnosis for the omeprazole, GERD. 
However, the patient had never had a GI problem before. So this case study is a classic example of the healthcare team not paying attention. I cannot overemphasize the importance of procuring an accurate, comprehensive patient history. Constant reassessment of medications during each visit is also crucial for preventing polypharmacy. So let's take a look at a few questions. How do PPIs help in NSAID-induced ulcer prophylaxis? The answer is proton pump inhibitors, PPIs, help heal NSAID-associated ulcers by inhibiting gastric acid secretion. Next, what other medicines are choices for NSAID-associated ulcer prophylaxis? The answer, misoprostol, brand Cytotec, seldom used due to GI adverse effects like diarrhea and H2RAs like famotidine or ranitidine. And finally, what could have prevented the GERD diagnosis? The answer is, medication reconciliation happens when a patient comes to the hospital, and knowing why the patient took the medicine could have clarified the correct diagnosis. And now here we are with Maya Thompson. Uh, her last of the five weeks in her academic appy. And again, if you're interested in doing an APPE with me, please contact me at tonythepharmacist at gmail.com. Uh, we can kind of talk about it, see if it's going to meet uh, what you want. Uh, I do still do some occasional virtual uh, appies. And again, I know with gas prices and kind of things that are going on in people's lives, sometimes virtual is a little bit better. Uh, because I have all three components, online, virtual, which means we meet at a certain time, and face-to-face, -face, uh, it's a lot easier for me to do uh, one of these kinds of academic appies remotely uh, than it is maybe for other people that are teaching and so forth. So again, uh, if you're interested in academia and teaching in some regard or another, uh, it's a lot easier to get into the classroom at the undergraduate level uh, than it is at the graduate level. And I get that you're going to be teaching when you get into residency, pharmacy students or nurses and physicians and things like that. But really what you want to focus on is are you able to engage? Are you able to present? How are you creating materials? How are you creating curricula? How are you working with feedback? How are you interacting with students? And what you want to do is you want to start where you're competent. So chemistry, anatomy, pharmacology, uh, those are subjects that I teach and uh, you would be very competent in if you're a P3 moving into P4. And I know that sometimes academia is a little bit tough to get into the classroom because if you're getting your appy in summer, for example, at a traditional pharmacy school, there wouldn't be much to teach there. Whereas here, uh, we teach all three semesters, fall, spring, summer, and uh, I often teach uh, three to four sections. So again, Tony the Pharmacist at gmail.com, and here we go, Maya Thompson. Hey, welcome to the Pharmacy Residency Podcast, member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network. Here with Maya Thompson in her fifth year of her appy, or fifth year, fifth week of your appy. Uh, sometimes it maybe feels like five years. Uh, and so it's going to be our, our last uh, podcast while she's here, at least, uh, maybe something in the future. Uh, but I wanted to talk to her and kind of finish up cracking the clinical case part two, uh, where she's going to give us four tips on uh, getting through the case. So, welcome back to the Pharmacy Residency Podcast. Thank you. I'm sad that it's my last episode, well, maybe, but hopefully we can get some good content out there. So thank you again. Yeah, I'm excited for you. You're going out to Tempe, someplace that I went right after graduation and uh, just a really great town. And so uh, always, always love that appies can be both exploratory and then, you know, obviously you want to learn something as well. So let's get right to it and talk about cracking the clinical case part two. Uh, what is our first step? And it may be intuitive, but maybe we could go through the four steps and then give them in detail. So what would actually be the first four steps or, or your process uh, for cracking a clinical case? Yeah, so I would say uh, just the first four steps in general. One, collecting information. Um, so you were just given the case. Collect what you need from it. Two, maybe so listing the drug therapy problems that you might want to solve or what you see as issues wrong with the case. Three, creating those solutions for your problems that you've listed. 
And four, uh, pretty important, but sometimes people forget, is the follow-up. Uh, following up with your patients, um, making sure you have all the information, or even ask, you know, what else do I need to know? Awesome. Okay, so in terms of collecting information, it's probably going to be pretty standard what you're supposed to collect. But when you're actually talking to a patient, uh, you have a lot of experience at the hospital uh, doing this kind of thing. What tips do you have for collecting information for a patient case? Yeah, so um, right off the bat, you're going to be given a case, and it's kind of your job to decipher the information given. So if they come in with a chief complaint and, you know, they're on an inhaler, okay, great. What inhaler? Are they adherent to the inhaler? Most importantly, you know, are they using it how they're supposed to with that inhaler technique? Just kind of collecting information that could maybe help you solve these problems later on. And so this could be anywhere from lab values, you know, past medical history, symptoms, um, just even patient demographics are all are super important. Okay, so we're we're collecting the information, and uh, just tell me a little bit about how you do it in your job, because you generally have to collect that information from many different places. Certainly, the patient, if they're conscious, <laughs> uh, would come with some of that information, but what what have you learned in your job that's made it a little bit easier for you to collect patient information? Maybe it's in interacting with the patient or ways you've interacted with family or caretakers. Uh, what are some maybe tips that you have on collecting good information that's relevant in a somewhat efficient manner? Yeah, so I always like to start off with the patient, just kind of get their side of the story. I mean, it is their medications that I'm dealing with. Um, but maybe if they're confused or they aren't able to necessarily speak on their medication, I'll go to their pharmacy or their family member. And that all kind of uh, varies just based on their disease state that they have as well. You know, if they have some memory impairment, maybe somebody else manages their medications. And so it's really important to kind of go through and say, okay, if my patient's not my next, my first reliable source, what other sources can I have? Pharmacy, you know, um, so we have our fill history, uh, what about the patient's family, any other caretakers that we have, or even past admissions. I think one of the easier problems is to figure out what to do when you see that there are two things that are an issue there, but uh, what recommendation do you have to help someone find what is not there? So sometimes the issue is that they are not on a medication that they're supposed to be. Why aren't you on omeprazole for you know, uh, ulcer prophylaxis? Why aren't you on this or why aren't you on that? Uh, how have you gotten better through your work experience at finding out what's not there and, and seeing like, hmm, this one seems a little off. There's something missing here. But that tends to be the toughest thing to find. Yeah, so I would say just all, it's recognizing patterns first and foremost. So when I look at a medication list and I see these disease states, I'm going through my head and saying, okay, what medications should they be on? And then I'll go and look at maybe clinical notes or I'll look at, um, or I'll even ask the patient, I'll be like, oh, okay, so you have this disease state. Um, I know sometimes patients are put on this medication. Is there a reason maybe that you weren't? Did you discuss with your provider? And sometimes they can give you information. Other times you might even be you know, solving a drug therapy problem and realizing, oh, they don't have this, but they actually do need it. And so that's kind of where you know, collecting that information is super important. Yeah, I know, especially with those kinds of disease states that maybe don't have so many symptoms, uh, hypertension, uh, things like that tend to be very difficult for the patient to say, okay, I know why I need to take this pill. I'm just, I just don't feel it. Whereas something like asthma, where they maybe find out that, yeah, I, I take my controller medication every other day. Things go a lot better. For myself personally, I know that I have seasonal allergic rhinitis. And when I don't take my fluticasone or Flonase or whatever, then uh, I'm going to end up going to the store to get some of those breathe rights because I'm going to be congested. And, and I know that that's going to happen. And fixing it takes a, a little bit of time. So you are working on collecting the information. Um, do you talk to any practitioners at this point, or are you really just working with, I don't mean just calling the pharmacy to see what they're on, but have you had a situation where maybe there was a drug therapy problem that was more emergent, or how do you communicate with the next person, hey, I saw this, uh, this is something you might want to look out for? 
Um, so I immediately right away would maybe ask like my pharmacist or um, if we're wanting more information, I would go to the source for the patient and who manages the patient as well. Um, just because I'm briefly looking in on their, you know, admission or their disease state, I don't really know the full story right there. So um, I'm going, I'm asking my pharmacist. I mean, for example, um, I know this patient was, um, he had nitroglycerin on his med list. He also had a PDE5. Oh, and I was geez. like, <laughs> okay. And I was like, well, how often are we using this? Because this is concerning. And the doctors and providers didn't look into it at all. They didn't mm-hmm. know that it was there. And so that's just like one way to just kind of, hey, bring it to your attention. And even if they already know that it's there, at least you're being conscious and you can, you know, recognize that there might be some interactions. Yeah, it's a very tactful way to, to say, hey, you know, you want, maybe want to just double check this one. All right, well, that, that kind of brings us into listing RX therapy problems. When you list those problems, do you, like, make little notes for each of them? Uh, how does your note look? Uh, basically, you know, you, you, you're now saying, okay, I see a problem with my experience and, you know, as, as this is my job, uh, how do you articulate that in writing uh, and then maybe speaking to someone? Yeah, so I first off just look at the case kind of as a whole and I say, why is the patient here? Mm -hmm. And then that's kind of my first problem I want to solve. And so I'll set aside more of the time uh, for that initial problem so I can really, you know, make a solution as to why they're here. And so I'll hone in on that first problem, kind of complete it, and then I'll go through and say, okay, maybe what are some other things that I can add? Maybe not necessarily to their direct chief complaint, but might help them down the road. And so it's all about, you know, these, I mean, it's supposed to be complex. I mean, there's people are on a bunch of different medications, might have a bunch of different problems. And so it's all about kind of... um, Relating back to that chief complaint first and foremost, and then seeing what else you can find. Yeah, I, I just went to a physician recently, and it was a little bit of a surprise at the end when he's like, and, and kind of not related to this, but have you got your shingles vaccine? Have you? And I'm like, oh man, I did turn 50. And, and it's like, I know I was there. I had a bunch of friends over. I, I, the, the event happened. But a lot of times we don't think, oh, we've got this thing that happened in our life. Now it's time for some things to happen. And maybe <laughs> should probably do that with my car too, 60,000 miles, whatever it is. Okay, so we've gone through collecting the info. We, we've listed some of the drug therapy problems focusing on the chief complaint. How have you gotten better or what resources have you used to create better solutions? Because it, it's not always cut and dry. And sometimes you're almost presenting the problem and just saying, this is what I see, Mm -hmm. Uh, this is what you might do, but you might also do this, Mm -hmm. depending. Uh, How do you create solutions with your hospital experience? Yeah, so first and foremost, like if we have a problem and we need a solution, um, I think it's really important to go to guidelines. And I can't stress that enough when you're talking about patients and things like that. Hospitals might have guidelines in place specific for their institution, but also, you know, um, just in general, I know like the American, like, for your heart or things like that, they'll have different guidelines for these disease states. So it's important that you follow that. I know like it was very difficult kind of transition as a student looking at lecture notes and then now we're only looking at guidelines now and that's something that we really need to practice so being familiar okay which guidelines should I look at and then if you don't see an answer in guidelines okay maybe what else do I know that's kind of out of the box that I could try and think of and it might not be the right answer but maybe somebody will applaud you and be like oh wow I didn't think of that but not quite exactly what we were going for, but I like your, you know, initiative and in taking that answer. Okay, so I, I love that uh, when you say you're creating solutions, you're actually uh, going to the literature, going to the guidelines, figuring out how you can communicate in a way so it's not really you saying this is the best thing that is. It's just saying, I see here in the guideline that this is the best way. And I think that many a fight has been saved by... Uh, that navigation in your car where the third party is saying turn right here instead of the other person to the other person and it sounds like that that's kind of what it is is where the guideline is is kind of the authoritative third party has been there before seen what uh, we're really you know dealing with but 
Uh, it also provides some competence when you're talking to preceptors. Uh, what is one or two guidelines that you've kind of focused on? I know you've had some time to work on some patient cases while you're here, uh, but what are some of the guidelines that you've seen uh, that you think are essential as you're kind of going into your appy year? Yeah, so I think definitely um, the IDSA guidelines for infectious disease, those are huge. Um, so we need to know just kind of, you know, what are the common disease states that you might see? Um, I did a patient case on COPD, so I was looking at the COPD guidelines, um, just kind of going through those. And I know as pharmacy students or pharmacists, maybe we get really caught up in the fact that there's medication, but also we have to remember there's non-pharmacological things that we have to do. And so I always try and think of, okay, here's my medication solution, here's my solution here, but what else can I maybe suggest to the patient, oh, like, let's increase your aerobic exercises, let's try and do, you know, the DASH diet, uh, smoking cessation, like all those things are also huge for disease states. Okay. So we've collected the information and we've listed some problems, we've created some solutions. Uh, hopefully some of those uh, solutions have been implemented. But this is where it gets really kind of tricky because, for example, I had a toothache, I went to the dentist, the dentist sent me to the endodontist, the endodontist sent me to the oral surgeon, and I was asking the oral surgeon questions that really the endodontist might have should have been answering. And so it became this thing of, you know, okay, I've, I've done the handoff, but I, I don't really have the follow-up from the first two. It's like, I've done my part. And we've all seen those PowerPoint presentations where three people split it up, and it seems very fragmented. Uh, how have you created a system for good follow-up? Because I think that good follow-up is one of the things that, as you mentioned at the top of the show, people tend to forget about. They're like, okay, I got that p case done. Well, sort of, right? Uh, there might be some longitudinal component to it. But tell me about good follow-up. Yeah, so... I just always think like, for example, if we're starting a new medication, we obviously want to know how that patient is doing on the medication. Now that kind of depends on what medication I guess you're starting. If you sent them home with an antibiotic that's for a seven day course, you're not going to follow up three weeks later. Um, you'll maybe have them see, you know, after the course is done, see how, you know, if they come back with we can do blood work, see if, you know, their infection's gone, maybe if they're still having pain or, you know, their source of infection is kind of cleared, okay, then we can kind of see that as a follow-up. You know, if we start a Torvastatin, we might have the follow-up a little later on. Yeah, sure. I mean, <laughs> the effects aren't going to be seen right away. Right. So it's just all dependent on maybe what medication. And it's just kind of learning the profiles of this medication and just recognizing, okay, I need appropriate time frames for these medications or for these follow-ups. And with any changes you make, you should have a follow-up with the patient. Okay. And some other things that I, I remember you, you mentioned um, besides the collect the information, list the RX therapy, create solutions and follow up. Uh, in interviews, when you're trying to become a resident or a PGY1 to PGY2 or even looking for uh, a position as a clinical pharmacist, one of the things they're really going to want to kind of figure out is what is your thought process? And so this thought process is somewhere in your brain. Uh, how do you articulate your thought process? How do you show them what you're going through? Because I feel like they're, yes, looking for the answer. Yes, you got it right. Yes, you got it wrong. Um, it's kind of like picking multiple choice. Okay, you got C. The answer is C. Now explain why. So tell me a little bit about the thought process and how important it is to articulate it. Yeah, so I think just being able to answer how you came to that solution will go miles in your you know, interview just because they want to know, okay, if you're presented with a problem that doesn't necessarily have clear cut steps, how are you going to get there? Um, and I mean, not every patient is straightforward, as we know. So we have to kind of think of our, our thought process and really um, become experts with it. So, you know, if they come in with a chief complaint, like I said, what is the evidence to back that up? Okay, but then what's something on the outside maybe that we didn't think of? Or what are solutions and how can we possibly get the answer that we absolutely need? And just kind of practicing, the, like, I almost do a stepwise approach. And I know sometimes that can just be very clear cut when patients aren't necessarily like that. And that's something I need to practice. But just going through and really practicing, okay, 
this is what I did for this, this, and this. Now I need to do it over and over again, and then you can be more fluent in your clinical knowledge. Okay, and then one last point that you had made was about the patient care plan. Every place is going to be a little bit different in what they want, but certainly a comprehensive plan that articulates your competence, your ability as a practitioner. Tell me a little bit about the patient care plan and and how this all comes together in the end. Yeah, so the patient care plan just... With our solutions, kind of addressing those, if we're starting an antibiotic, we don't just want to say, oh, let's just put them on amoxicillin. What dose? How long? I mean, what are we looking for? Is there drug-specific information? Like, not just a very bland answer. So we have that. Um, We also have how we're associating or how we're interacting with other providers because we aren't, as pharmacists, the only people that are looking at these patients. And so we had to, we had to take into account, okay, we have uh, their PCP as well that's not in the hospital. Maybe we need to reach out to them and kind of relay what we've started or what we've initiated here. And so just making sure that once the patient either leaves the hospital or leaves an ambulatory care setting, um, they kind of know what's going on. We've taken into account maybe like their financial factors, um, all these different things that kind of go hand in hand with caring for a patient. Um, Not necessarily just their medication, but also, you know, non-pharmacological and financial things as well. Yeah, there's that expression, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. And there's a lot of ways to show that and follow up, uh, having a good comprehensive plan, showing that your your thought process is sound, uh, bringing you know everybody to the table. These are all great, great uh, ways to do it. So just one last time, if you could give us the four different tips or strategies to uh, crack the patient case, and then we'll finish up. Yeah, of course. So the four steps for tackling a patient case. One, we have collecting our information. Number two is listing our drug therapy problems. Um, Three is creating our solutions. And lastly, four, follow up. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks again. Well, thanks again for your, <laughs> thanks for your service. Thank, <laughs> thanks for your service to the, the students and uh, to DMAC. And I personally appreciate all of your help. Uh, you've definitely uh, brought a, a level of engagement that's uh, always a little bit tough when you're, you're here alone. And, and I appreciate you uh, using the whiteboard. I appreciate you bringing in some very high level, I don't even, I mean, we would call them games, but Uh, All I know is that, you know, they've kind of perked up uh, quite a bit uh, when you've been speaking, and uh, it's always both exhilarating and disappointing when uh, the next week comes and they ask where you are, and I'm there, and I'm like, well, I'm here, and they're like, well, where's Maya? And it's like, well, she's gone to Arizona now, and it's like, okay. So again, thank you, and uh, appreciate you being on, not not only on the Appy, but uh, on the podcast. Thank you, Tony. Hey, thanks again for joining us on the Pharmacy Residency Podcast. If you want to comment and hear back from me and don't want to have to deal with an email or anything, uh, all of these episodes go on Tony Farm D, T O N Y P H A R M D. Uh, always just kind of pick the episode that you want to talk about and just say something in the notes. Uh, I usually get back to everybody pretty quickly. Uh, they give me a little email that, hey, somebody's commented on your video and, you know, I'm happy to engage you from there. Or you can email me directly at tonythepharmacist at gmail.com. Uh, if not, check out residency.teachable.com where you can find all of my courses and the free pre-residency audio academy.